Good afternoon. We're just waiting for everyone to join. I see the numbers climbing. And as people are joining, I'll just uh, say welcome to the ALD Connect Bootcamp for Symptomatic Women. Um, my name is Kathleen O'Sullivan Fortin. I'm on the board of directors. And on behalf of Kelly Miatnin and our executive director and the entire board of directors and all the volunteers that have helped put this event together, we just want to say thank you for joining us. Some of you are lucky enough to join us live, and some of you will be watching a recording of this. Um, I would like to introduce our panel today for symptom management. Dr. Pablo Gomery is a urologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital in the Department of Urology. Camille Cor Corre, Cor Corre, Camille, have I ever figured this out? Sorry. You know, Side, works. Side conversation. Is a medical student at the University of Rochester School of Medicine. She previously worked with Dr. Florian Eichler and was the project manager for ALD Connect, so many of you will recognize her. Dr. Melissa Trovato is the Director of Rehabilitation at Kennedy Krieger Institute. She is also an Assistant Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, I know everyone's here for the disclaimer. Please note that this webinar is, not, is for informational purposes only. The discussion is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you are a family member or ill, or if you suspect that you and a family member are ill, please seek professional medical attention immediately. ALD Connect does not recommend or endorse any specific physicians, treatments, products, or procedures, even though they may be mentioned on this webinar. <sighs> Camille, take it away. Any questions will be we'll get to at the end, and they can be in the chat or the Q and A. All right. Can you all see my slides? Okay. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for the warm welcome. My name is Camille Kaur, um, and as Kathleen mentioned, I'm a medical student at the University of Rochester. Um, and today, I'm going to talk a little bit about a a uh, research study that we did at Massachusetts General Hospital um, with Dr. Gomery and Florian Eichler um, to look at urinary and bowel symptoms in adults with ALD. So I wanted to start out by touching on the motivation for this study and really just reinforcing the importance of the patient perspective and ALD Connect's role in this. So the this initial study was born out of um, you know, three different kind of main categories. So patient experiences, patients who would come to clinic and tell us that urinary and bowel symptoms were really detrimental to their quality of life. Um, and then we also learned from all of you at um, ALD Connect annual meetings, patient learning academies, and community calls. For our study, um, we were able to collect the experiences of 109 adults with ALD, 53 of whom were women with ALD. And this study um, involved kind of three main types of information. We started by going back in time and looking at the medical records of every woman with ALD who has been seen at Massachusetts General Hospital. Based on that, we formulated a list of questions and pieces of information we wanted more details on. And then we sent a survey um, to those same patients as well as patients who had not been seen at our hospital. And then finally, we looked back at the results of urodynamic studies, which are a type of medical procedure that lets us collect more information about urinary symptoms. And today I'm gonna to talk about the conclusions we were able to draw from all of that information. So um, in terms of thinking about the burden of these symptoms um, in women with ALD, we found that just under 85% of women in our cohort have experienced at least one urinary or bowel symptom. The three most common symptoms were urinary urgency, which had a median age of onset of age 50, urinary incontinence first presenting again around age 50, and fecal urgency presenting an average uh, of about 54 years. And then the um, percentages here, um, it's important to note, are based on our entire cohort, which included women um, as young as their early 20s to women in their early 80s. Um, and so this is just sort of a snapshot in time of how many of those uh, women have experienced these symptoms. When we looked at all of the urinary and bowel symptoms together, we found that um, the average age that patients first presented was age 35. We also thought about the fact that with sort of compounded gait and balance difficulties, 
it's likely that patients and women with ALD have an even more difficult time with these symptoms than patients who don't have ALD. We found that um, just under three quarters of patients reported that these symptoms limited their quality of life. And then about 40% of patients reported a moderate to severe limitation to their quality of life. Finally, we found, um, and we were interested by this fact that um, about three in five women actually developed these urinary or bowel symptoms before they developed other symptoms of ALD, such as gait and walking, or gait and balance difficulties. So I pulled out these three pieces of information that I think really helped us to understand what the day-to-day -day experience of a patient is who has these symptoms. We found in patients who reported urinary frequency that they reported um, voiding or urinating an average of 10.2 times in a 24 hour period. And then next we looked at patients who have reported both urinary urgency and urinary incontinence. And we asked women from the time that you first experience urgency to the point when incontinence is absolutely inevitable, they told us they had that mean warning time of just 3.8 minutes. And then a similar statistic for fecal urgency and incontinence, women had an average warning time of 3.2 minutes. So really just helping us understand, you know, the urgency of these symptoms and just how much that's limiting patients' day-to-day -day lives. So this is a figure from our paper um, that helps to sort of delineate the differences in the presentation of symptoms between men and women with ALD. So in this figure, the blue lines indicate the symptom course in women and the red line indicates the symptom course in men. And so you can see that while symptoms are prevalent in both populations, both populations definitely experience all of these symptoms, we found that women tend to experience symptoms an average of 10 years later than men. Um, so just kind of adding more nuance to this concept of, you know, what exactly is it that distinguishes the, um, the male and female experience of living with ALD. So this figure is intended to show just all of the things that patients have tried in order to manage these symptoms. Um, just over 50% of patients um, who have symptoms had tried at least one medication. And then 70.8% of patients with at least one symptom have tried some sort of lifestyle modification or other intervention things like restricting their caffeine or alcohol intake, planning their daily schedule around their proximity to a restroom. Um, and so this I think was helpful in helping us understand, you know, it's interesting that so many patients report that their quality of life is limited and yet not all patients have been able to try an intervention. So I think at least to me, this um, provided sort of a glimmer of hope that if we're able to hone in on which strategies are actually most effective for managing symptoms, we might be able to help women um, gain better control of these symptoms and regain some of that quality of life. So I'd also like to point out some specific sex differences um, that you know, we sort of already knew going into this study and that we discovered over the course of doing this research. So again, we found that both men and women with ALD are affected by these symptoms. We found that women experience the onset of symptoms approximately a decade later than men do. We also found, um, you know, in both men and women, this sort of common pattern of, you know, first the onset of urinary urgency, followed by the onset of urinary incontinence. And what was interesting is that in men, there tends to be a gap of several years between the onset of urinary urgency and urinary incontinence, whereas in women, the symptoms tend to present at the same time. Finally, um, we found that it, it is actually slightly more common for women to develop urinary and bowel symptoms before they develop other symptoms of ALD, like gait and balance difficulties, whereas men, um, you know, it was a little bit less common for them to do that. And then finally, just tying this back to things that we already understand um, about the differences in symptoms between men and women. So I have up here um, sort of a simplified image of the anatomy of the male and female genitourinary systems. And some of the main differences that we think about um, in terms of these symptoms are women having a shorter urethra um, than men do. So that's the tube that's going to connect the bladder to the outside of the body. Um, and then you also are gonna have some different organs in the pelvis that are impacting these symptoms. So women are gonna have a, a uterus right there in the middle of the pelvis that men won't, um, whereas men's symptoms are more, uh, more so affected by the prostate. 
So the last component of this study was looking at urodynamic studies that some of our patients underwent. And so a urodynamic study is a procedure where through using um, you know, different catheters and electrodes, we're able to understand the pressure and volume differences that happen over the course of filling and emptying the bladder. And so when we think about the process of normal urination, there's a couple of different things that have to happen in the right order and in sync in order for the process to happen correctly. And so the way I like to think about it is that the bladder has to contract to let the urine out, and then the um, urinary sphincter has to relax. And so if those things aren't happening in the correct order and in sync, you're going to start to have some of these urinary symptoms. So based on the urodynamic studies that our patients underwent, we found three different patterns of basically what's going on in the bladder and in the urinary system. So the first one, which was the most common, and 10 out of 11 patients of ours had this, um, was the presence of involuntary contractions of the bladder muscle or the detrusor. So this is primarily an issue during the process of filling the bladder. And again, going back to our you know, imagery here, if you're contracting the bladder when you don't want to, you're more likely to have what we call neurogenic detrusor overactivity, um, which can present in patients as urinary urgency or urinary incontinence. The second pattern that we found was motor underactivity of the bladder. And so this is an issue primarily during the emptying phase of urination. And so again, if you're not able to contract that bladder muscle appropriately, you're more likely to have symptoms like urinary retention or urinary hesitancy or difficulty initiating the flow of urine. And then the final pattern that we found in some patients was the contraction of the detrusor muscle and the relaxation of the sphincter being uncoordinated and not happening in sync with one another. So looking at these three mechanisms, different patients had different presentations. Um, and to a certain extent, these patterns are able to help us understand why a certain patient has specific symptoms. It's important to remember that a given patient may have multiple different sort of patterns going on. Um, but you know, if, if you're ever approached about a urodynamic study or wondering whether it might be appropriate for you, really the reason that we think about it is it allows us to tailor our interventions and our medications to the specific pattern of what is going on in your body. And um, so hopefully this gives sort of a little glimpse into you know, what this procedure is, why it might be recommended, and how it might help you manage your symptoms better. So in conclusion, I'd just like to give a huge thank you to everyone who was a part of this project. Um, you know, number one, all of the patients who contributed to this project, either through our clinic or through ALD Connect. And then I'd like to thank um, all of the different members of this research team. Um, so on the slide, Dr. Gomery, who is on this webinar with us today, Dr. Eichler, Dr. Sajadi, Dr. Hayden, and then Katie Becker and Natalie Grant. Uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to some great discussion later today. Excellent. So we'll pass it along, the baton along to Dr. Gomery to continue this discussion. I'm ready for questions. Excellent. Well, then before we do that, because I am already getting questions uh, both on this and in my cell phone, um, Dr. Travato, I would like to invite you to give your presentation and then we'll open it up because I know there that there's a lot of surprising overlap in symptoms and questions. Thank you. Uh, let me get to where I am. Share. There we go. Um, so today um, I'm going to be talking about mobility and strength training. Um, which we just learned does tie into some bladder in terms of physically getting to the bathroom. Um, so just for the purpose of this presentation, so people know the, the words I'm using. So when I'm saying that somebody has severe symptoms when it comes to strength, it's really you're unable to lift your leg against gravity. So if you're laying on the floor, you can't lift your leg up off the floor. Moderate, you can lift it up, up, up off the floor, but you can't get it all the way as high as you should. An asymptomatic to mild is really you're able to lift it with somebody putting resistance on that leg. You are still able to get it up off the floor. So in talking about walking, we're going to think about two things. So one, um, well, four things really, but speed and quality and efficiency and cost. So speed and quality, if we want to think about as fluidness, includes things like clearing your foot, how long you, steps you're taking, how smoothly you're taking them, and maintaining your balance. Um, efficiency is more about how 
straightness of your path, the distance you can cover, and the cost. So how tiring is it? And how much does that limit your ability to go to the distance you'd like to? So there was a, they had done a study at Kennedy. It's currently submitted for publication and in press, uh, but I do have permission to share, uh, to really look at the symptom characteristics of AMN in men and women to determine which ones have the greatest impact on function. And in function, we are really talking about walking. Um, so in this subject, there were 60 men, 80 women with AMN, and they could have been severe to asymptomatic. So anybody who actually had the diagnosis was included. It was a um, single session in the motion analysis lab, and then people were given individual exercise programs based on their characteristics. So the first thing we wanna look at is hip flexion strength. Hip flexion is your, again, if you're sitting in a chair or laying on the ground, it's the ability to lift your legs straight up. Um, so you're not at your knee, but up at your hip joint. So in looking at men in orange, women in green, people in the um, severe category mainly was men. Um, and you can see they could only with uh, resistance really get about five pounds of pressure. Um, for moderate in testing that, for the women and men, they got somewhere between 25 to 30 pounds. Mild, you can see, was more in the almost 40 to 50 pound. And then in the controls, women made it to 40 pounds, men's were over 60 pounds. So you can sort of see the gradation of as you get more severe, sort of that hip flexion strength gets worse. Another thing they looked at was sit to stand. So that is the how fast you can arise from a chair. Um, and to do this test, you're not supposed to use the armrest. You're just supposed to physically be able to stand up from the chair without any support. Um, and the assumption is the faster you can do that, the more strength you have and the more skilled you are at that. So in terms of people in severe category, they were not able to arise out of that chair without using the armrest. So they automatically um, were not scored. You can see the moderate takes closer to two, two and a half seconds, mild about one to 1.5 and controls were less than one, um, which is a more normal pattern and time speed for that. They also looked at dynamic standing balance and this gray in the middle should have been the green, I apologize. So again, looking at what's called the get up and go test. So it's standing up, walking a specific distance and turning and walking back to that chair and sitting back down. Um, and studies have shown that the time greater than 10 seconds relates to increased risk of falling. So this sort of correlates to falling and things that also lead to problems with your gait and mobility. Um, so again, People who have severe symptoms take much longer on their get up and go test. And sort of as you become more mild or asymptomatic, that gets improved, but not really reaching the level that the controls are in terms of how quickly they are able to arise. So they were focusing on walking speed and endurance as sort of an outcome measure. So just what does that really mean? So slowed walking is associated with uh, both reduced levels of community ambulation participation, higher energy cost. You just get more tired having to walk, uh, decreased quality of life because you can't do what you'd like to do, and then sort of development of secondary complications. So not being able to walk, being in a chair more, sort of the cardiovascular effects of that, the effects on length of muscle and strength of muscle as well. So um, how does this translate into everyday life, right? So I want to walk so I can do what? What is the, what we're looking at? So putting it in perspective for walking speed, so they used reference values that are in the literature of how long it takes to cross a rural street and then how long it takes to cross an urban street. And um, walk speed is found to be a common indicator for functional status. So if you look at um, severely impacted individuals, right, they are walking so slow they wouldn't be able to cross a rural street in a normal amount of time. Moderate really struggles in that urban street. Mild is, is able to cross that urban street. So the faster you're walking, sort of the more likely you are to be able to achieve your distance goals. And they also looked at endurance. So this um, is looking at distance walked in six minutes. So um, has anybody, if anybody's been to the Kennedy Krieger Institute, a lot of times the physical therapist will do a six minute walk test in the clinic visit. And then we track that over time and we look at, you know, how is that impacting your function if that walk test is going down and what does that mean? Um, so we sort of, again, there was norms in there about um, the endurance you need to be in a crosswalk, the endurance you need to get through a supermarket. And again, the um, severely 
um, affected individuals really couldn't even walk very far. So they were sort of not really meeting that um, six minute walk test. Um, but they sort of got maybe to the residential crosswalk level. The six minute walk for the moderates, you can see they are close to being able to walk around the supermarket without problems. And then for the milds, um, they clearly are, are doing fine and, and that skill translates it fine. We didn't put controls on here, but a control could walk about 500 meters in six minutes. So they would be up here, just their normal able-bodied controls. But again, it sort of shows how endurance and walking speed relates to sort of real life activities that you might want to be doing. So why is this important? There's a study back in 2012 done by Jen Keller and a group at Kennedy Krieger that showed that hip strength most impacts your walking speed, which then translates into this impact of your daily function we just discussed about. Endurance impacts your walking speed. Um, we just showed and talked about that walking speed and endurance worsens with severity of your AMN and symptoms. And then more recent data that's under review also showed that a targeted exercise program has been shown to improve hip strength and improve walking speed. So getting to sort of what individualized programs that we might recommend for somebody with um, AMN symptoms, or maybe even asymptomatic because we want to keep you fit and we wanna keep you moving. So stretching, why is stretching important? Really, um, a lot of times as people have that decline in function and more severe symptoms, they start to get tightness at their um, joints. So mainly like their knee joints might get what's called contracted, or their heel cords get shortened so you can't move your foot normally, which impacts your ability to walk. So we always wanna address tightness or we wanna prevent shortening of that by having a stretching program. The importance as well is having normal range of motion when you're walking and at your joints is it allows you to use the strength you have in sort of the right position for that gait pattern. So it's about making your pattern better and if your pattern's better, then you use less energy to walk. Uh, treadmill training, again, to work on gait and sort of patterning of your gait. Progressive strengthening to strengthen muscles. Um, aquatic therapy has been shown to, um, it helps make you stronger. It helps increase your endurance. It doesn't necessarily translate into your gait pattern being prettier uh, because you really have to work like land therapy makes your gait better um, because you have to be practicing that skill basically to improve it. But there's still benefits to that endurance and that strength. Um, even if your gait's not prettier, you might still feel better when you're walking. Um, and then use of what's called functional electrical stimulation where they put um, little pads on the muscles and actually use an external device to help that muscle contract um, to help try to strengthen it or to help again, sort of retrain your gait pattern by using the functional electrical stimulation while you're receiving therapy service to improve that. Um, and then we do recommend equipment such as canes or other items. And I really want, sometimes we use that in very mild, from a strength perspective, patients seem mild, but really their balance isn't great and we want to use it to, for falls prevention. So again, we're trying to prevent um, secondary complications if you fall and you, break your hip or something else happens. Those are things we're also trying to prevent um, when we're thinking about therapy and patient care. So for our patients, we want to think exercises much match your ability. They have to match your ability. So if you're in the severe category, we don't expect that you're going to go to the gym and, you know, start on a weight machine at 50 pounds or something. It really has to be tailored to your level of functional ability as well as your level of strength. Um, so it's important that we really customize things. Um, so if we think about that each group or person is significantly different in strength and ability, so each really requires an individualized program to address those deficits. Um, so in summary, uh, really the take home points of all the impairments, weakness is the most prevail prevalent feature affecting movement performance. So if there's one thing you can target, that would be what to target. And that weakness um, in AMN typically lies in your hip girdle muscles. So your ability to raise your leg, the ability to, if you're lying on your stomach, extend your leg or raise it up off the floor, and then your ability to move your legs from side to side at the hip. All those tend to get weaker, so we really need to focus on those. Um, weakness affects both men and women. Strength varies from person to person. 
Uh, preliminary data shows us that strength and walking speed are changeable and can improve. And it's very important to have an individualized exercise program. Um, and for our asymptomatic um, ladies, so even if you have normal strength and you have no symptoms, exercise in general is important to help with your cardiovascular fitness and prevention of weakness, weakness that either might be related to ANN if you develop symptoms, but also related to aging. We all get weaker with aging and it's important to keep that strength, which will keep you functional down the line, even if you start to have symptoms. Um, so exercise is important regardless if you have symptoms or not. And then just in terms of thinking, I talked about customization of your exercise program. And a lot of patients, I know we see patients that really struggle in their community to find a physical therapist who even knows what AMN is. Um, and it's really hard. Not everybody has access to a big center, um, but things to think about. So one is we usually recommend that when you're looking for a PT, find one that has a specialty in neurology. So PTs can get different specialty certifications. Some are orthopedic. So maybe they're dealing with you know, patients with knee replacements and hip replacements and back pain, which isn't necessarily going to translate into knowing how to treat you. Um, so you want somebody who treats patients with neurology. So as an example, if there's a PT who treats patients with multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, strokes, that would be a PT that would be more appropriate, even though you don't necessarily have those disorders, but you have a neurologically based disorder and you have weakness that they would be able to treat. Certainly, if you have the availability to seek out a university center, you're more likely to find um, PTs who are specialized and maybe have seen similar patients. And then always ask questions. So you want to communicate with your physicians, problem solve, have somebody who listens, listens use all your available resources um, to help research that problem. There is, and I don't have it with me, but there is a um, the main licensing or certification board for physical therapy, which I think is the American Physical Therapy Association. But there's a website you can go on actually and do like search for a PT and you can search by certification and then see where they're at. So it's a really good resource. I don't have it in front of me, but certainly I could get it to ALD Connect if they want to send that out because I think that's a really great resource for patients as well. Because like I said, it's not always easy to find a PT who's knowledgeable. Um, and then certainly when you're, wherever you're working with your doctors, or if we have a PT in the clinic, we have a PT in clinic, they will, our PTs will talk with local PTs about what, what AMN is and what the treatment in terms of therapy re recommendations are. So we can help guide the local PT as well. Um, and I think your physician or whoever you're seeing could probably help with that too. Um, that is the end. I thank y'all. This is so excellent. Well, just keeping Dr. Travato, while I've got you, uh, there came a question came in that asked um, whether or not there were any patients who used assistive walking aids in the study, or if these were all folks who were getting around on their own. I don't think they let them. Well, the severe patients who couldn't complete the walking test would have used the device, but we tried not to have them use the device to get the data, if that makes sense. Excellent. Thank you, because I know that's always a subject. Um, and so I know that there are a lot of questions coming in. Camille, thank you, because I know I've seen you trying to um, address some of them. Um, one specific question that comes up over and over again is, what is the relationship between, in terms of bowel bladder, what is the relationship, if any, between um, having had children and um, the symptoms, because I know uh, I hear a lot and I, from my peers that um, people say, oh, it's not ALD, it's because you had children, or this is the natural function of aging. Um, and is there, you know, I'm curious to see if, if that's true, if it's not. It, uh, go ahead, Camille. I'll definitely defer to you for some more details on this, um, but I think just in general, it, so it is absolutely true that, um, you know, women who have gone through childbirth, whether it is a vaginal delivery or a C-section, um, can both have, um, you know, urinary and bowel symptoms that are impacted because of that. And what we do know on a very basic level is that women with ALD are having more symptoms and more severe symptoms than would be expected with just a history of childbirth. Um, at this point, we don't have 
enough data to be able to say exactly how much of that impact is because of the history of childbirth. Um, you know, but anyone who says to you that, you know, these symptoms are, you know, totally normal and you should accept them and it's just a part of being a mother, um, you know, that person ought to do a little bit more research and understand exactly what's going on in ALD. The, the reason we do urodynamic studies, as Camille pointed out, is really to find the answer to that kind of a question. When a patient comes in, whether she has or has not had a child, or, but even if she has and she has problems, we really wanna know what the problem is. If we can find out through the urodynamic study what the problem is, we can decipher and discern whether this is really a problem secondary to childbirth versus a problem secondary to the neurological condition or both. So that's that was the whole point of Camille's presentation about the urodynamic study. The urodynamic study is a nice physiologic way of finding out what exactly is going on. Excellent, thank you. And I was also wondering, um, you know, there was also a question about, uh, is it, do people, in staying in the bowel bladder field. Um, do we, do people, is it normal for people or to have you seen many patients that have kind of intense um, constipation followed by fecal incontinence or is that a pattern that you see or is, is it really, is, is there a predictable pattern or is it kind of depends on the patient? That's absolutely something that we see as well. Um, just with the, for the sake of time, I didn't go into all of the specific symptoms we looked at, um, but just under half of the women in our study reported uh, constipation. Um, the average age of onset of that was in the early 50s. Um, and, you know, again, just like with the urinary symptoms, there are different patterns of symptoms that patients have. And so I kind of focused on some of the most common ones, but um, absolutely constipation is something that seriously impacts our patients as well. And the, then important, the important point to realize from Camille's presentation is that just as she pointed out that different patients have different presentations, for instance, we call them in, in the urinary domain, underactive, overactive. Same thing can happen vis-a-vis -vis bowel function. It can be underactive or it can be overactive, and it can change during the course of the disease so that you can go from an underactive bowel which presents with constipation to an overactive bowel which presents with fecal urgency and perhaps fecal urgency incontinence. So again, that it, it points out the importance of doing studies to find out exactly what's going on. There is an equal study uh, in the gastroenterology domain called anorectal manometry, which again is geared towards finding out these answers. The other important thing to realize, and this is really a very important point that we've only found out through research in the last 20 years, is that bowel and bladder neurologically are very intertwined. The nerve roots that come off your lumbar spine at the point where they come off are together. They're essentially plastered together. And what we found out in the last 20 years is that as a result of this, they send each other neurotransmitters. And when one goes awry, the other one goes awry. So it's crucial for, in order to have both systems functioning properly to ensure that, you're, that both bowel and bladder symptoms are paid attention to. Because if you only pay attention to one, it may not be enough. And those two tests the, um, for both systems, are they available? Is that something that is widely done by urologist GI or is that a specialized come to, you know, a big hospital like Mass General or places? Is that As Dr. Travato pointed out, the, uh, the ability or the validity of the test varies across the board you have unfortunately today you have to have very specialized and expensive equipment so 
going to a small practice, they're going to have less adequate equipment, obviously. So the tests aren't the same. Excellent. And Dr. Travato, we are um, we had seen a lot of questions come in about, and I know you were answering this of of um, who to see to set up a personalized um, physical regimen or of uh, kind of therapeutic movement. Is there any kind of who do, who would someone go to to find out, you know, what what you need in general? Is that is the same person who's leading you through that PT the same person who's who's telling you what to get, or how do you know when is the right time to, to go to the right person or get um, the right intervention? Right. And I think part of it depends on where you are, right? Because um, not everybody, unfortunately, has the same access to services. If you live in a small rural community, it might be different than if you live in Boston or Baltimore or somewhere like that. I think if, if you can get to even just one time to a center who can evaluate you, um, it's a snapshot in time, but they can at least come up with a, a plan, right? A neurology plan, a uh, rehabilitation plan, a PT plan, um, you know, some sort of resource to just help you with that because it really is going to be important to tailor it. I would just say, um, and if you don't live local enough, working with your local neurologist maybe to help find, like again, a neurology PT, I would think those are probably a little more common in communities just because of the prevalence of stroke and other things that are out there. Um, and then, you know, I don't think we've ever turned down a PT from a community who emails us and says, hey, can you tell me what, like, what are some guidelines or basics you use? And then they take that and customize something for that individual. Um, so I think it's using all your resources. Certainly don't, I think it's okay for you to have a PT reach out to a center, even if you have not been seen there, just to provide what is your standard guidance, and then they can customize it to you. Because um, I think that's the really important thing is we don't want to say, oh, this is the, you know, everybody should be doing this one exercise to strengthen your hip flexors because it may not work for everybody. And then you get frustrated if you can't do it and you're not doing it right, then you can get hurt. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. I think um, I just answered a question sort of like this. I think if you are asymptomatic, it's really about finding something you like to do. Um, having some strengthening, knowing that around the hips gets weak and some cardiovascular um, and picking something you like or you won't keep doing it. So I think for asymptomatic, you have a lot more flexibility in what, you know, just find something you like to do. If it's swimming, you swim. If it's you like to ride a bike, then ride a bike. Um, but as you get symptomatic and depending on your level of severity of that, it needs to be more customized and tailored and finding somebody who, even if they don't know, is willing to reach out and ask for help and guidance, I think is important. I, don't, I think that answered the question, but. Absolutely. Okay. And then, so I know that, you know, for, and in both of these um, different sets of symptoms, it seems to be that it, there is no one size fits all. There is no magic, magic pill, magic button uh, that would fix everything. My question is, it are, are there things you should avoid? So is, is there something that, you know, we may not be able to, to list what are the top three things you should do, but are there any things that you should avoid? Are there any, you know, are there any certain exercises you should avoid? Is there any cert, sort of injury or caffeine or anything that you would say, you know what, we have noticed you're better off staying away from the following, or is that just not worth asking because it's the same answer as everyone's different. Yeah, I don't think I can point out there's one thing that everybody should avoid because I think it's really different if you're asymptomatic versus symptomatic and what your functional ability is, what you can do. Sure. It's just most important to, I think, not overdo something, right? So don't push it too hard where you're, you know, can't get up the next day because you're so sore or you're weaker um, or you get hurt. I mean, those are the big avoid getting hurt. I would say if we had to avoid something, but otherwise <laughs> getting a plan for you, like getting a, a tailored program, if, if you need a tailored program and then sort of sticking with that. And it's really about, you know, it's not just like everything, right? We get up and we walk every day or whatever it is. Exercise is something you have to do frequently. You can't, I always tell people, it's not about that PT visit once a week is not what's making you better. 
It's mm -hmm. helping change your plan or giving you different things to do, but it's really what you do at home every day that makes the difference. So finding something and sticking with it, I think is the, the key to that. Excellent. And Camille or Dr. Gomery, any, anything that people should avoid, practices, you name it, in terms of their bowel and bladder health? Or is there anything people can do at home that's non-interventional to try and assist, strengthen, avoid? Camille? Uh, one thing I think that a lot of patients find helpful, especially if you have an appointment, you have a plan to, you know, see a urologist about these symptoms, is to keep a symptom diary mm -hmm. and come to that appointment with as much information as you can. Um, you know, come ready to, to say, you know, what are things that you've already tried? What has helped? What hasn't? Are there times that you notice the symptoms are worse? Um, you know, are there, are there activities you do that seem to worsen them? When do you notice the symptoms the most? Things like that. Um, you know, I think in helping you make the most of your appointment, that's one thing. Absolutely. I know I always think of things as they come up and then I show up and it's my one time to shine. And I'm deer in headlights. I forget everything. I remember it when I hit my car, the car park. <laughs> So I'm just quick scanning through. I'll ask a question oh, yeah. um, of Camille and Dr. Gomery. Um, so sometimes what I'll recommend or we recommend is pelvic floor PT um, to try to strengthen that pelvic floor. Do you think that's helpful? I think it's very important, again, to know exactly what you're dealing with. Unfortunately, some pelvic floor physical therapists are quick to recommend certain standard basic exercises that may be absolutely the wrong thing. For instance, going back to the initial question of a lady who has just delivered a baby and she's having some urinary stress incontinence when she coughs, sneezes, or laughs, there's the standard Kegel exercise which was designed by Dr. Cagle in 1949 for that option. Unfortunately, if a patient has certain urinary, uh, a certain problem, a certain disorder, that may be the very wrong exercise to recommend. So again, if you don't have a urodynamic study to know exactly what is malfunctioning in that lower urinary tract, these standard recommendations, and I see that all the time, that they're, they're recommended without knowing what really is going on with the patient. So again, it has to be, it's the point that you all have been making for the last 30 minutes. Everything has to be tailored to the individual and whoever is treating you has to, whether it be a physical therapist, a, a Rehabilitation person has to be tailored to the disease process also, an understanding of it. And unfortunately, AMN is a very, very unique disease. So what I heard is sometimes it might help, but sometimes it hurts if it's not, if the, based right. on what the urodynamic right. shows. Okay. Like in, like in any Anything. other walk of medicine, if you don't know exactly what you're dealing with, you can't simply recommend something across the board. Right. Yeah, we don't recommend across the board. It's usually specifically tailored. I'm just curious if you thought there is a subset that it's helpful for. But it sounds like there is based on the study. Right. Thank you. And, and, you know, uh, physical therapy has just begun over the last few years to become highly specialized, as you pointed out. So, you know, there are people who are, but again, it, it, as you very well already said a couple of times, you know, there are, you know, in rural settings, there'll be general physical therapists in cities and academic centers, they're gonna be highly specialized. And it's the usual back and forth between that kind of primary care versus specialized care. We've had this argument going back a hundred years as to how to do this. We don't know how to do it well. And I'm wondering, for both, for all of you, um, do you have any suggestions or do you have you 
in terms of working with your various patients, have you come in contact with some any helpful hints? And I invite actually all the participants who are watching live if they want to type it into the chat. But what are some some helpful things that help you manage your symptoms? What are you know? I know some people will come to the, so I, I am lucky enough to help host the um, monthly women's call. And some folks will come in again and again, and um, they're asking their peers um, some questions about all these symptoms, but they are they seem to have a hesitancy about coming in and actually asking officially for help. And I'm wondering if you guys have any advice for someone who's, you know, it, when is enough symptoms to come in? Would it be, are you annoyed by someone who comes in with mild symptoms? Um, ca can you do more if, you, if people do come in while they're mild? If you have severe symptoms and have been holding on to that at home, is it still worth coming in? Is there something you can do? Because a lot of women will tell me, why bother? There's nothing they can do. Um, and I'm curious to see from your perspective, as you evaluate all your patients, you know, when is the right time to come in? From a rehab perspective, right, it certainly coming in, even if you're mild, makes sense because, again, we've shown that we can, or whoever it is, right, if you have weakness, we can try to strengthen that. Now, if you're in severe, we may not get you up and as mobile as you were, but for mild and moderates, we show we can strengthen and improve function, which improves, in my world, quality of life from a rehab perspective, if you can do what you want to do. But I think even if you're severely affected, right, have you really, has somebody really maximized your function in that, say you're in a wheelchair, at that wheelchair level? Do you have the best chair? Does it fit the way it should? If you have an ill-fitting wheelchair, really you don't, it doesn't work for you. Your wheelchair needs to work for you and it needs to fit well. Do you have all the other assistive devices you need to be safe in your home so, you know, you don't fall and you don't break something? So I think there's things that can be brought regardless if you're asymptomatic and it's just a conversation like from neurology about these are things that might be coming down the pike and from rehab about keeping your strength up and having an exercise program to severe, we're really looking at what is your environment like? How do we modify your environment or what you're doing so you can be successful and hopefully keep doing what it is that you enjoy in life? And for, for you guys with urology, um, can is it worth coming if you have severe symptoms are there drugs that i i saw someone post earlier about mirbetric mirbetric yeah. i'm glad you said it because i cannot um but are there you know are there drugs that can help intervene absolutely uh, point number one is that you should always come in if you have any kind of question because it's it's the old argument of preventive mm -hmm. versus late intervention. Preventive is always worthwhile. And point number two, uh, Kathleen, I think you, you mentioned that some women would say, oh, well, I don't, I've found in my 45 years of medicine that women are much, much more likely to come in even early on with any kind of problem. Men live in a wor different world called denial, which is a river in Egypt. And as a result, uh, you know, they come in rather late because they're always sort of feeling like, well, I'm a real macho, I can do this myself. And, uh, and unfortunately, that's very uh, not good. It's very self-serving. Uh, and so it's always worthwhile to come in and learn about what to do, especially in regards to the urinary problem with this problem. It's also, what we wanna do is also prevent kidney deterioration. Mm -hmm. And so the earlier you face your urinary problems, the less likely you are to have any kind of kidney issues. Whereas you never know what's going on silently and you can actually injure your kidneys. That way, depend, as Camille said, there are different presentations and one of them actually can hurt your kidneys. Sure, and would it, and so it would help to have that urodynamic. Um, absolutely, absolutely, and and also, uh, as much as I would, as much as I congratulate the lady who sent the comment on the chat that Mirbetric helped her enormously. Again, it's not 
nobody should take that as something that you should take across the board because it all depends on what's wrong with you and whether the Mirbetric is the proper targeted medication. I'm going to throw in one other thing, Kathleen, in regards to Kelly had posted something in the chat about quality of life tips or recommendations. Um, it's not really a, a PM&R thing, but we typically, or I think it's thoughtful, I don't know. You have to think about like, sometimes we recommend psychology services, right? Having this diagnosis, it is a very big life stressor. If you're asymptomatic, it's a stressor because you don't quite know and regardless of how you're affected. So I think in one thing's in terms of managing your own health and maybe mental health and how that translates to your quality of life, I would say that's one thing I think is really important. Um, you know, having somebody to talk to and sort of that you can express everything that's going on who might, you know, help you sort of process it at least and work through it. Yeah, I, I fully agree that the future of medicine is multidisciplinary teams. So it'd be ideal for a patient to come in and see a physician, a physician assistant, a physical therapist, a PM&R person, a social worker, a psychologist, all at the same time so that a, a team can best together integrate whatever decision making needs to be done. And we have, we have these multidisciplinary teams already set up in cancer mm -hmm. management, but cancer management is way ahead of everybody else. And unfortunately, in these kinds of issues, we don't have these multidisciplinary teams. But how well we're going to practice medicine in the future will depend on our ability to set up these teams efficiently. And right now, we are not there. But I agree with Dr. Trovato. The more of these people that are involved in your care, the better off you'll be and quality of life will be improved. Absolutely. Well, it is funny that you guys say that because uh, just five minutes from now, there will be a session about mental health and coping with your diagnosis. So what a perfect transition. I swear we have not scripted it. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you all. Thank you so much, Camille and Dr. Trapato and Dr. Gomery for coming and answering our questions. To the folks watching at home, yes, there are still a few questions that are, that are just late popping up. We haven't had an opportunity to answer. We, again, we are trying to record those and we'll try and make sure that we can try and get the answers to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your Saturday with us and be well. We'll see you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you.